Welcome to our Bible study, everyone. It is Saturday, October 8th, 2016. And before we get started with today's topic, uh, Tom is going to say a few things. Oh, well, good morning. Thank you. So uh, just a couple of thoughts from, from our last Bible study. So um, this, this thought about uh, turning away from God. Um, you know, uh, um, just very briefly, but, you know, after Adam and Eve were uh, expelled from the Garden of Eden, uh, so they kind of turned away from God. It says here that uh, um, when Enos was born at this Seth's son, okay, uh, that the, uh, um, the people started turning back to God, and it says in the Bible they became children of God. So this is a thought about what it means to turn to God. Um, but there is a sense that uh, then over time they started turning away from God. So, um, you know, like when uh, during the time of the judges, um, it was a the time they turned away from God and, uh, you know, the, the land was desolate and they were attacked and uh, this prophetess Deborah came along and turned them back to God and there was peace in the land for many years. Um, so what does this have to do with the Bible study uh, last week is... Um, you know, it was it was focused on um, David, and uh, uh, we also talked about Saul. Um, so, um, at this time, you know, Samuel had died, and the Philistines were gathering to attack Israel. So Saul um, was very afraid of being attacked by the Philistines. Now, you know, he didn't have David at his side because you know that David was, uh, um, had, you know, we talked about in the Bible study, he had uh, actually gone and uh, lived with the Philistines because he was afraid of Saul killing him, okay? Um, so we have uh, uh, Saul being afraid of being attacked by the Philistines. And, um, you know, he said that God was not answering him, and that's when he um, went to seek uh, the uh, the witch of Endor. Um, and, uh, you know, what it said was that Saul was very, very distressed. And, um, you know, he's uh, turning away from God, seeking a witch, you know, familiar spirits, it says. Um, and, and he thought of, the, of God as his enemy. He was not obeying the God. So that's the kind of position that Saul was in, you know. Um, now we know with David that, uh, you know, he was not really, uh, uh, you know, he was not perfect. He did a lot of bad stuff. He was living the life of a bandit when he was with the, uh, the Philistines. But, you know, in our Bible study, you know how we, we talk about this sort of was a theme of uh, restoration. So um, and when uh, David um, was told not to join the Philistines in the fight against the, Il the Israelites, okay, so he goes back to his town of Ziglag and finds that it had been burned and all the women and children had been taken. And so uh, David, also like Saul, was extremely distressed. They so have two people, different situations, you know, not, not exactly the same, but Saul was very distressed and David was very distressed. And you can see what they're going through, uh, you know. Um, so they weren't perfect people. Um, things were going really badly, and, and we saw see, see that uh, Saul um, basically gave up on God, you know. So David being distressed, um, what did he do? He turned Actually, to God. I'll ask this. Can anybody answer that question, I, or maybe it's a rhetorical question? Well, he turned to God. Yes. Yeah, the big distinction between him and Saul, he turned to God. Okay, and so what was the result of that was that there was a lot of the restoration. They got the women and children, the old men back, and all their goods. And then uh, David went and restored, uh, you know, all those goods to uh, all, all the people, including the 200 men. Remember, so it was very magnanimous. And then he sent a lot of the goods to cities all over Israel and stuff. And so uh, you see what's happening with David. There's a lot of restoration here, with the people and with David. Now what happened with Saul is the Philistines were winning the battle against the um, Israelites, and Saul was, you know, very afraid of being killed by the Philistines. Uh, so what did he do? He killed himself. 
And then what happened with David with all this restoration? All the people were restored. David himself was restored. And that led eventually to him becoming king of Israel. So anyway, that's all I want to say. So um, think about uh, two different people, um, both in um, different circumstances, both greatly distressed. And um, how did things turn out depend upon whether they turn towards God or away from God? Thank you. I think it's a very important point. Pretty good object lesson. Yeah. And we can ask ourselves because I know in the practice, and I'm sure Florence sees it too, there are those people, the minute they get into trouble, they get upset and they they will blame God or turn from him, um, turn to something else. They don't get their answers immediately or in the way that they want them. Uh, and it, it results in only further misery. In the case of David, he turned to God. Got everything restored and ended up becoming the king of Israel. So, good and little it, reminder. Yeah, and I just, one addition to that, and I just want to mention this, to, especially to those of us who have been in the Christian science movement for many, 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 many years. Haven't we seen a lot of people, when they're in a great distress, turn to a practitioner, but not to God? What do I mean by that? They want the practitioner just to, fix it, just to fix it. Yeah, they will turn to a practitioner. They will hope that the practitioner will push a magic button and take away their problem. But yet, they're not willing to open their heart to God, make the changes that are needed to, to be made. That's turning to the personality of the practitioner instead of to the Christ office of the practitioner. Yeah, it's, it's the same God. thing. Same and thing blaming that, the practitioner if it doesn't work. Same thing, <laughs> that, same thing that Saul did when he turned to the witch of Endor. Think about it anyway. Well, if you turn to it in a personal way and, and just for the quick fix, yes. But in, in our church, the practitioners here don't allow that. Um, we, we don't. We can't do that here. It won't work. And, and the practitioner, that's not the purpose of the office. Exactly. And that's why we're independent, I'm sure. But in the movement, I've seen this over and over again. Also goes back to motive. One motivation is just to get the emergency resolved, but the other motive, true one, is to learn to be a servant of God. If you do that, God will take care of all of your issues. Every one. Thank you. I think the okay. other thing to add here is the, you know, instead of just turning to God with your whole heart, stop and question, you know, why is this happening and the history of it. It only makes it worse. It only makes the evil or the error uh, more real to you. But you see, I see this, and I'm sure many does too often, you know, turn into why and what and all that. <laughs> I, I, I saw an article that says when you do that, you're really making the bump in the road worse than, you know, going forward. Right. Well, you're you're giving it a cause. You're justifying its existence, and then and then there you have it. There it is, right there. So you know the only cause is God. There is no other cause. To get back to your absolute truth, that steamrollers all of these uh, misconceptions of ourselves and of others. Okay. Thank you all, Betty. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I'll start with the uh, quote. It's from Message for 1902 by, in prose work by uh, Mary Baker Eddy. Our thoughts of the Bible utter our lives as silent night foretells the dawn and din of morn, as the dullness of today prophesies renewed energy for tomorrow. So the pagan philosophies and tribal religions of yesterday, but foreshadowed the spiritual dawn of the 20th century, religion parting with its materiality. 
Christian science stills all distress over doubtful interpretations of the Bible. It lights the fires of the Holy Ghost and floods the world with the baptism of Jesus. It is this ethereal flame, this almost unconceived light of divine love, that heaven husbands in the first commandment. Thank you. That's a beautiful quote. Thank you. Topic, shall I go on? Uh, Topic, whys and wherefores. And um, I just got that from all the questions. Um, Anyway, the Bible readings were from uh, John 8, 1 through 12, and John 7 for some background. Um, Question number one, where is the Mount of Olives and what significance does this place have? Well, it's east of Jerusalem. Um, it says um, it's separated from the eastern hill, the Temple Mount, and the city of David by the Kidron Valley. And the Mount of Olives has always been an important feature in Jerusalem's landscape. It's a big hill right on the edge of Jerusalem. And uh, Jesus taught on the hillside frequently, didn't he? Yeah. Yeah. It was part of the route from Jerusalem to Bethany. And he would often, I, I guess a few things I read said if Jesus ever had a favorite place, it was probably the Mount of Olives. And it was once covered with olive trees. And at, at the foot of the Mount Olives was the Garden of Gethsemane, where he ascended to heaven, Acts, preached there, made his triumphal entry into Jerusalem from there. And they think, you know, because he would often frequent that place that Bethany was where Lazarus and his sister stayed, that he would stay there with them. Yes, now it's a, a huge Jewish cemetery. Um, I was well, Adam, with, go ahead. Uh, well, I read that. Um, well, Zechariah fourteen four refers to um, the coming of the day of the Lord, and the Jews had the belief that the that uh, when the Messiah came that the resurrection of the dead would begin there. It's in Zechariah 14.4. But uh, became, and it became a place where Jews wanted to be buried. And even Prime Minister Begin asked to be buried there because they felt it was a very sacred place. Interesting. Well... Do they want to be buried there because they think they'll be first? To... Uh, yeah, it sounds, it sounds like <laughs> that's, that's the reason. Wow. And Zechariah, probably. A little superstitious, but... And apparently lots of, over the years, lots of things... I mean, there, there have been thousands of graves there. And a lot. some of them have been overturned and um, things like filling stations put there <laughs> in parts of it. Did you see it, Tom? Uh, yes, I did. Actually, I didn't go to it, um, but um, yeah, I could see it. Uh, I was in Jerusalem, uh, walking around, and I, I could look up and see and see it. Looks like the pictures, you know. <laughs> so, is it very steep? No, but it it kind of it it goes up a long ways and. Um, I suppose if you're up there, you're going to get a good view of um, Jerusalem and the area around there, you know. Um, but, you know, I I guess I would think of it more of as a gigantic hill, 
you know. Okay. Because it's, it's a 20, mountain, you know. 2,900 feet high. Yeah, it's tall. Any, anyone else on that and the significance? Um, there were some things that happened there in the Old Testament. I believe something, um, they had, uh, David went there. I don't remember all the details. And then uh, Solomon also built a, a temple, not, not in a very good way. It was uh, for one of his wives who believed in um, another god. Uh, but I guess over the years, a lot of people, a lot of important people in the Old Testament would go to the Mount of Olives. It was a, just one of those places that was a very special place. I also read that it's where the Lord's Prayer was taught. Oh, that's lovely. And the weeping over Jerusalem. And there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It seemed like it was Jesus' favorite place to teach. But there was room for, for all the multitudes when they did come. And what a difference between how he used it and everyone else used it. Mm -hmm. Right. Shall well, we? Well. Betty? Okay, number two, and this is basically in uh, John 8. Why did um, Jesus come here, and was this his first time? And I think we answered that. But why did he come here in this particular case? What was going on? Was it the Feast of Tabernacles? Well, yes. Yeah. But was he getting away from anything? Yeah, he had just had a set to with the Pharisees. And it seemed to me as I read it that this was a place for him to go and be quiet after they had challenged him and were not very nice. Yeah, they were after him. is why he would retreat, I guess, at night and not stay there, probably going to Lazarus's house. But yeah, they were all out to crucify him. It was a very hot time. Anybody else? I had read somewhere that he was also following God's timing and that he was getting some pressure to go into Jerusalem, but he said it wasn't time yet. Thank you. Okay. This was his time for communing, wasn't it? To be alone with God. Yes, and he went down the next morning very early to teach in the temple. I guess that was one of his major places. He would go to the temple to teach people. Yes, that goes to the next one, I guess, Betty. We have a we have a phrase that we sometimes use when uh, the, when we describe how we kind of clear our thinking or when we Say we we go to the mountaintop. Anybody ever told you to go to the mountaintop and commune with God? Get your thoughts clear. I mean, it's a metaphor, but I think that that's what this did for Jesus. It was a way for him to get away from everything and be at one with God. 
From what we read from Jesus throughout the Gospels, apparently he did this very frequently. It was a very common thing for him to do a lot of the time. By Jesus the way shower, I'm sure. But I think you think it's a you know, it's a good example for us. We all need time to sort of get away from our daily routine, commune with God. We all have our different mountaintops, <laughs> you know, wherever you go, for peace and quiet. And I read the people there were receptive, so he went there to further teaching, to do further teaching to them. Yeah, and very often when he would come down from any mountaintop, he did end up teaching and healing because he was in that divine state after having time alone with God. Very important that we all, yes, go to our mountaintop. But he rose up early that morning to go there to teach. And what was the question about that? Why did he go early? Why did he go to the temple early in the morning? And, um, and basically, he went there to teach, but this was something that he did um, despite yeah, showing up in a place where they might find him. That's yeah, it was the Sabbath. People were there, ready to be taught. The Pharisees were there, ready to hang him. He had no fear. was speaking. Matthew Henry said, um, when a day's work is to be done for God and souls, it is good to begin betimes and take the the day before us. I looked up the word betimes and it means in good season or before it is too late. And I was thinking that that's what we're we're taught to do as soon as we we wake up in the morning, we know that God is mind, God is my mind, God is the only pure and perfect mind. Thank you. I was going to ask the significance of early in the morning. Very important. You start your day early in the morning with this prayerful turning to the Father. And why is that? got to have your thought right before the noise of the day comes in. Yes. And it's putting God first before anything else. Absolutely. Otherwise, you're mesmerized before we start, huh? Yes. <laughs> you know, at times I would hear people who would read their lesson at the end of the day. Well, as far as I'm concerned, forget about it. <laughs> <laughs> But I think it also says something else, you know, in Science and Health, it says meet every adverse circumstance as its master. Before we get started, we have to establish the mastery of the Christ in our own thought and motives, the way we're going about doing things. Otherwise, we're playing catch-up. And playing catch-up, you know, there are times when we have to do it. It seems like I do it most of the time, but the right way to go is to establish the mastery of the Christ first. That way you're ahead of him. I think we know from a Jesus example, that's pretty much what he did. Because when they came after him, he was ready. He was. It's so true. You're ahead of the game. You're ready. Otherwise, you get up mid-morning all groggy and what the heck's going on? It just doesn't <laughs> work. And of course, he was thinking of those in the temple that were going to be taught by him. You know, first thing in the morning, your 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 thought is like a sponge. You know, it's ready to be filled. And out of love for them, he filled them with the truth first thing in the morning. So it's his great love for mankind. I have on my lampshade, I cut it out of one of our lessons. Psalm 143, 8, you know, that one, the cause me to hear thy loving kindness in the morning. For in thee do I trust. I love that. Thy loving kindness in the morning. So important. And 
we, you know, these simple things we were taught, we reteach. So as Dale says, you start off with knowing God as your mind and your life and the daily duties Mrs. Eddie gave us. Then you go, turn to your lesson, and you study and pray over the lesson, not just read it as fast as you can to get out the door, but to spend some time thinking about it. And we were taught here to write a statement of truth that, that uh, speaks to you each morning and keep it with you. You know, it's interesting. I, I, ca I have done that over the years, and I, I have found some old boxes. And in those boxes are all these statements of truth. And I, it's, it's wonderful. I mean, it's just wonderful to do that. And as you do it, and as you work with those statements during the day, the one statement, um, you, you use it, and, and it becomes you. It becomes part of you. You're replacing the old man with the new. And during the day when negative thoughts come, you can turn to that one statement, whatever it might be, and uh, re rebuke the error that's trying to claim entrance into your thinking. And you, you'd be surprised what this will do for you. You do it each day over the years. You've just got a collection in your head of the renewing of your mind, statements of truth. Do it early in the morning as we were taught. We're like a sponge, so fill your thought with that truth. You'll find your boxes later <laughs> filled with statements of truth, reminders of who and what you are as God's child. It's a wonderful way to begin the day. Pretty soon you can't do without it. My, you just can't can't start your day any other way. You just feel unprepared and not not right. You crave you crave that time with the Father. It's essential to your being. It's vital. That's how it should be. Anyone else? Okay. Number four, what did the Pharisees try to do and how did Jesus handle it? They tried to trick him with the woman and bring her in. He did adultery. They were going to try to trap him. Either he was going to break the commandments or he was going to break the Roman rule one way or the other, depending on his decision. They were trying to get him to say something that they could use against him. They desperately wanted to get him out of their hair. He was, he was ruining their party. It must have been that part, because after a few times, <laughs> I would have been like, okay, there's no no sense doing this to this guy because he's just gonna <laughs> make me look like an idiot. So I'm just gonna stop. But but of course they did not stop because we have this whole idea of this Messiah who really truly was going to uproot everything. So they wanted a human Messiah, and they got the spiritual version, and that's not what they asked for. And this is why they uh, were not going to bend. And he was upturning everything that they were about. So they were constantly fighting. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Zary, and, and thank you, Gia. <laughs> yeah, somebody agrees. <laughs> yeah, they, were, they were trying to get him. The very fact that they hit him with this question, now, what do you say? What sayest thou? <laughs> He went all this way just to find out, say, what sayest thou? And they were like trying to drag some words out of his mouth to try to catch him on something. Yeah, and it says in the Bible they were tempting him so they could accuse him. It was all planned out. Think about in your own experience, you know, if you have someone who who's out to trip you up, ask you a question, and think about how Jesus handled it. He was poised in his handling it. He doesn't let. He did never let them trip him up. 
He just couldn't do it because he was in the divine mind. This example in this story was just marvelous. The wisdom of divine love, which manifested through Jesus. Because these guys came in, they're telling the story, and he just let the story sit. Because error needs to be exposed. Obviously, the error regarding the adultery, adulterous woman was exposed. There she was right in the middle. But what about the error of the self-righteousness of those other people? That needed to be exposed. So they shut off their words because error always, you know, exposes itself. And Jesus just let it sit. Let it sit. Come in with a quick response. But let the exposure of the self-righteousness happen. After it rested on him for a while, then he came back and says, okay, anybody in you who doesn't have any sin in him, let him throw the first stone. By that time he'd said that, the conscience thing had kicked into place with those self-righteous people. After all, they'd already shut off their mouth. And if you ever get put into a situation like that, you know, you can take your time. You have to blurt out some answer. Jesus took his time. Yeah, he rode in the sand for a while. (laughs) (laughs) They certainly didn't plan for that. (laughs) (laughs) He didn't stare him in the eye. He didn't, you know, he didn't come back sharply. He just stooped down and was riding in the sand. You know, I I heard a sermon once where they said, uh, I guess it's speculation. I have no idea. I'm sure it is, but they're saying what he was writing was the sins of the people there. Yeah, I've heard yeah. that too. Mm-hmm. Could could be. That action is like shutting the door in that era. You all foolish people, <laughs> shut it. <laughs> it's annoyed because he wasn't answering. I know. <laughs> all things, if you've ever come at somebody and, and they're just suddenly doodling. <laughs> yeah. Well, he refused to stoop down to their level. They were trying to bait him. He wasn't going to go there. He kept his thought with God. I know Mrs. Singletary has told me you never argue with an error. You just have two beasts. (laughs) Right. Nobody wins. Nobody ever wins an argument. Why argue with it if you if you're knowing it's a nothing anyway? Exactly. And and I know all of you who have ever tried arguing with an error, you do know you end up with two beasts. No one wins the no one wins an argument. That's another statement. Because people just dig their heels in deeper. Much better to be quiet as Jesus was. And he often, it's interesting, because he often returned a question with a question, didn't he? Yes. He put it back on them. And, you know, th- this is a, an important point, the lesson of this story. Um, it's interesting, because I, I read that, you know, it's only w- once in the Bible, this, in John. You can't find it in the other Gospels, and some people wonder if it was really true, but I'm sure it was. Anyway, um, what is the lesson in it for us, other than to be poised when Era is trying to challenge you? What's the other huge lesson in this story? God, what to do? Well, yeah. It's not a, It's not up to us to condemn anyone. Thank you. Yeah. I had read in a commentary that um, Christ was also trying to convince and convert them, not to destroy them, but to save them too. Yes, he was. Of course. Thank you, Shardy. Absolutely. His teaching extended definitely to them. Many of them turned eventually to Thank you. Yep. Christianity. But I was going to say, they did turn. Some of them did. Teaching was undeniable. But 
I know, being raised in Christian science, I was this little do-goody, you know, Christian scientist, very self-righteous. I absolutely was. And, and I, you know, you still hear it. This is one of the things I know that turns off people sometimes to Christian. That's why what is so wonderful about Christian science. Um, it took me a while to understand and get all this. But uh, never, you never judge and condemn. It's never this, I'm better than somebody else, or the self-righteous sense, which I had in spades. And because I did, I, I got <laughs> dragged through the muck for a long time until I learned some humility, which is the best thing that ever could have happened. And again, who did Jesus come after? Was it was it the adulterers? Was it who who did he go, come after? Self righteous. Self righteous. Hypocrite. Hypocrite. And that's why he could turn it on them. And who is without sin? And at the same time, this doesn't mean we tolerate error or turn, you know don't ignore it. But um, first, we cleanse ourselves in order to help others. But all this condemning and all this stuff that's going on and from the news, frankly. Uh, <laughs> and, that's and a good lesson if you're ever going to run for president, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Anyway, yeah. It, we got all these hypocrites condemning one another. I mean, this is the perfect, perfect story. And we don't condemn. And, and all of this judgment that goes on about other people. It's not Christ Jesus' way. Make no mistake about it. And we all have to have that humility and not think we're better than anybody. And if anybody is, is in an error, um, they need to be let free from it. As Jesus did with this woman. And sin no more. And all the other hypocrites, I mean, I'm sure they had to learn a lesson because they weren't without sin. And they knew it. Who is? I'd like to meet you if you want. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be offended then. <laughs> <laughs> so, Seems to me, like, uh, in response to even what Gary said and thinking about this and now going on, is that, again, it's all smokescreen. It is. All manipulative and dis deception. Yeah. It's not about what the person actually did, um, but to use it. Absolutely. You know, Mrs. Eddy, I guess it was Mrs. Eddy, but anyway, it goes up like a great big balloon in the air and everybody's gawking at it. In the meantime, all other much more important issues are going on that are being totally disregarded. They are smoke screens. And, and that's why the television is, can just shut it off most of the time. And as we talked about with this hurricane, we just shut it off. What Parkins wrote was so true. Uh, they just put it out in front of you over and over in a pulsating way to mesmerize you and to malpractice on everyone and each other and on, in the case of the hurricane, on Mother Earth, if you want to call it that. But it's, it's mortal mind. And the last I heard, it's down to uh, category one. But we keep that work going. All these things, and don't they, they are smoke screens. Thank you, Linda. Absolutely right. But you also have to, uh, one, one of my watches is to do about, since I've been in the U.S. for four weeks, uh, it's just this mesmeric sense that people are afraid of germs. They are afraid of this. There is a whole fear factor. Buy this because of fear instead of because we love. Thank you. And as long as people are fed this, if you look at the television, which I, you know, don't turn on, but if you turn on your computer and you look at this, you know, these election uh, debate farces, you know, uh, people are taking stones up and saying, she's a bad one, he's a bad one, but not doing it out of sense of love for their own people. If you want to run for presidency, you must run with love and you must run with God. If you're not doing it, get out of the race. Thank you. Exactly. And we should be able to discern, shouldn't we, who has the right motive and who doesn't? Very 
true. Very yep. true. We should ask ask God. We ask should God. all ask God. He, he only knows. knows. He only knows, and he'll cut through all of this exactly. ridiculousness. Um. Yeah, you know that that sells, which is what sells is sex. Frankly, that's what a, a mortal mind loves to look at and think about. So, I mean, this has nothing to do with running of the United States, except a, a person's moral character, absolutely. But, again, we have to cut through all that and see what is really being said and done and who's, who has the right motive. So, I thought these are this is a lesson for today. Why did Jesus say, I am the light of the world in at the end of this, he got up and, and said this to the rest of the people that were there. Well, he went on to teach them. A, a, you know, the next passages from 12 on up to 32, a t- you know, having a conversation with the Jews. And many of them believed them. At the end, it said in, in verse 30, as he spake these words, many believed on him. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. So what is who who is the I that he's referring to? The truth. The spirit. Christ. Yeah, he's referring to the Christ, the impersonal Christ, which which animated him, which was his very life. His mission was to show that Christ to the rest of us. You know, when you're dealing with a practitioner, it should seem, feel like a light, lights going off. Uh, when you come in contact with any Christ-like thought, you should feel that light. I certainly know, and I've said this before, the first time I called Mrs. Evans, it was unbelievable. The light was a light. It was going to the dark corners of my thought, and I felt it. And I will never forget that. It's partly why I've been able to remain loyal for all these years, because I, that was the Christ. And that this is the light that you should be reflecting from God. You know, as long as there's light, the darkness cannot come. It's our greatest responsibility is to keep that light shining forth. Because the darkness is trying to come shut you down. That's why people who indulge, as we talked about, one of Satan lies, and we'll go to the next Satan lies tomorrow at the round table. Anyway, people who indulge in self-thinking, what are they doing to their life? Pulling the shades down. Yes, they are. (laughs) And what are they doing to help the world, mankind? Nothing. 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 Not even not helping, but hurting. Exactly. Right. That's why in science, I get where I don't have a lot of patience for it. At first, it's hard. I know you're coming out of a lot, and it took me a while. But when you continually and continually and continually indulge in this, you are shutting your shades down, and you are adding to the darkness in the world. Thank you very much, everyone. (laughs) That's how I feel. Thanks a lot. Can't you do a little better? <laughs> I mean, I have to laugh at it, and I know with my own self it took me a while, but um, if you look at it that way in practical terms, maybe it can jar you out of your self-indulgence. You know, we can only talk about someone's past for so long. It's over now. Let's get on with today. <laughs> are you going to be a light or not? Or are you going to contribute to the darkness? 
for me, this statement is extraordinarily important, partly just of my life path, because the world um, thought out there is that there's so many paths and ways to get this light, and it's all wonderful and good, and you just go your own way, and however it works and feels to you. And here he's saying, no, I am the light of the world. And all these other things try to claim they're the light. Thank you, Linda. And he warns us, doesn't he? Beware of false prophets. That come. Sheep's clothing. In sheep's clothing, but they're wolves. And that's the other thing to be to guard against, because of course they're going to come in a very benign way. where only your spiritual sense will direct you are right. That's why it's so important to develop it. Yes, Christ is the way, the light, says it in this, in this statement. I haven't made a research of other religions. I have never felt I needed to because I have felt the light of this Christ. Powerful thing. Mrs. Eddy says it illumines the dark places of earth. You know, when you think about our website and think about it often and pray about it and knowing it is doing just that, going out, illumining the dark places of the earth, so that people are going to find it and they'll feel the light in their in their life. You can't just, you know, when I had all these years of Christian science. Did I ever work for a darn thing? No, I didn't. Did I know how to work for my children? No. Did I know how to work for my church? No. <laughs> nope, nope, nope. Did I know how to work for the weather? No. We all know better. And this is what our life, why our life can be a ceaseless prayer. So when you think about our website, you pray about it our services, and it's, it's not just for this little Plainfield Church. This is for true Mrs. Eddy's Christian science, getting out, illuminating the world. I know when Florence reads Science and Health, that's what she's thinking. That's how she's praying. Readings that are going out on the Internet, on YouTube. for the spiritualization of all mankind, the light. Please, if you indulge yourself with your own pity parties, stop for your sake and for the sake of everyone. If it did you any good, I would tell you, please do spend <laughs> hours in feeling sorry for yourself. It does no good. You know it doesn't. It's worse than a waste. Well, it's also very selfish of you. Terribly selfish. Yes. That's, that's one of the main points here. And <laughs> it's very selfish. And that's why you're so unhappy. You're so unhappy because you're disobeying God. You're being selfish. And so you will be unhappy until you stop it. I mean, here was Jesus being attacked, being, and, you know, yeah. being, they were after him. They wanted to kill him. They drove him out of town. So what did he do? He got right up. First thing in the morning, he went back into the temple and taught. Helping people. Thank selflessly. You. Exactly. It's yes. a great point. Yes. He didn't. He could have been hiding out or telling everyone, oh, look, I've only done good and everybody's after me and this awful boo-hoo-hoo-hoo. He could have been doing that. If anybody had a right to do it, he probably did. That's not how you live, live life with a capital L. He was That's out there doing something unselfishly, unselfed. And because that, what is Mrs. Eddy said, whatever, whatever holds human thought in line with unselfed 
love receives, receives directly, directly the, divine the divine power. Power. That's what you. That's what you receive when you do a watch. That's what you receive when you're praying. That's what you receive directly, the divine power, which is what Jesus received. These are laws and principles of the universe. These are not my opinions. So when you want to get out of a, a pickle you're in, you do it by becoming unselfed, by obeying the precepts that you're taught in the Bible and science and health, as Tom brought out in the very beginning, which is what David did. You'll get out of the hole. And you don't mark the days and say, okay, well, I've been thinking good for a day now. Everything should be perfect. <laughs> you keep with it. Wonderful changes are taking place, whether you know it or not, whether you can see it or not. You will. It's there. Can't help but be there because it's the truth. I remember you. Oh, just a short story. I remember years ago, I got into this mental funk, depression and self-pity party. I got all dressed up for it and everything. It was just me and my... <laughs> oh, yeah. It was a big deal. I was going to light a candle and everything, put a little music on, you know, poor me. And it was on the weekends usually. And my friend said to me, oh, you're so selfish. Look at you spending the weekends alone and you're depressed and this and that. I said, well, yeah, of course. And then I got offended, of course. And then she said, get out there in the world. Be, make a difference in someone's life. Bless them. What's the matter with you? And I said, it, you know, it shocked me. And I said, I'm being selfish. And she said, absolutely. <laughs> Look, the focus is on you. And I immediately, I got up, I got out and never again, I said, geez, I want to make a difference. But I was so absorbed into myself and depressed and pity. And I was like, so it, it changed me. It woke me up. And I didn't realize how selfish I was being. That's wonderful, Lucy. What a, what a good. wonderful story. And what a good friend. What a, couldn't could, have a better that friend. <laughs> that's, that's a real friend. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. It's so true because that self-thinking, it just turns you on to... You know, this is wrong with my body, this is wrong with this hip, and this is wrong. It it can't do anything. That what Mr. Sadie says about too soon we cannot turn from disease in the body to find disease in mortal mind and find its cure in working for God. I feel this is what it's saying. Do something. Absolutely. That was a life changing statement Mrs. Evans gave to me. Get out and do something. And even if you think you don't have anything to give, you do. You'll find it. But and smile. It doesn't cost smile. nothing. Exactly. And if anybody doesn't know already, that sentence is in Prose Works in the article entitled Fidelity. And as we, we've talked about, expression is the opposite of depression. So you express God's goodness. Think of others, and you'll find yourself um, leaving all those that dark place way behind you. I've got good work to do. Being the light, you should express that light, not hide it under a bushel, we are told. Thank you, Mary Beth. Expression, not depression. I hear it in my, my mind all the time since you said it. Great, well, good. Good. These are just all truths that we pass on to each other to encourage and to wake each other up. And as I've told you, too, Mrs. Eddy could tell. She could sit in her study, and it was as if lights were out. She knew what students were light and what those that were not light, those who were darkened with self. So... You be one of those out there that's shining a light. Wherever you are, whoever's listening, be that light. And the darkness won't come. It can't. Isn't that amazing? You know, if you're in a light room, it can't, darkness just can't come. <laughs> I think there's someone. How can it? It just can't. 
I remember there was a time Mrs. Evans made me write every day something I did for someone. Yeah. And um, that was very helpful because I try to think each day, did I do something for someone? Yeah. Uh-huh. The only way to get out of it. True. Most of us here were given that assignment. And to do something and not, and if you can, to make it anonymous so they wouldn't even know you'd done it. Good way. Think of someone else to get you out of thinking of yourself. And as Florence said, if you do think of yourself, oh my goodness. <laughs> and pretty soon you're going to be, whoa, there are going to be a lot of things to think about. All your aches and pains and your misery. <laughs> and then nobody's going to want to be with you because you're so depressing to be with <laughs> You're pretty. You're you're gonna have a really good time with your depression. Yes, you are. Who wants to go to that? Mm. Yeah, you don't ever spiral upward. Like that. <laughs> <laughs> no, it just gets you go from worse to terrible. <laughs> so yeah, it doesn't go up. It does not go up. No. So Get dressed up for a pity party. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, goodness me. So, but again, that doesn't mean you ignore your problems. You address them and face them with the truth. And the truth, when you're doing that, you're going to be joyous, not miserable. So, did we cover everything, Betty? Does anyone want to say anything else? One thing I read, I thought this was so good, to identify yourself in Christ. And if someone or you get the voice that you're no good or someone tells you you're no good or whatever, you just say, I don't identify with that. That's not me. There's nothing to do with me. Keep your identity in the Christ, the light, all that's good. You'll be very happy and you'll make other people happy too. That's a good thing. You don't have to talk about it so much. You just have to be it. Right. Okay. Well, thank you, Betty. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Betty. Great. Thank you, Betty. Thank you, Betty. Thank you, Betty. Thank you, Betty. Thank you all. We'll see you all tonight and tomorrow.